morning. Thank you for being here at this, you know, slightly awful hour on a Saturday, uh, but I think we're doing okay. Um, so this is day two of Explorations in Medical uh, Humanities. Um, many of you were here for day one yesterday, which, um, you know, I'm just really thankful and grateful for everybody who participated. Uh, it was a really fantastic and stimulating day, and I imagine we will just have more of the same. So uh, I'm Rishi Goyle, and I'm going to be chairing this panel, though I think most of the people that are doing the work are to the left of me. So I will introduce each of them in turn. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'll just, if it's okay, I'll introduce all of you right now. And then um, Zoe will speak. Um, how long did we decide? But like 20, 25. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and then Matt will speak. Um, and then David will give responses. Um, then maybe there'll be a time to answer some questions. And then we'll take questions from the audience. That sound good? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So, you know, they all have very long bios, so I've shortened them now. Um, Zoe Will is an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at Rice University, where she is also a member of the Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality, and core faculty in the Program in Medical Humanities. Professor Will's first book, After War, The Weight of Life at Walter Reed, uh, from Duke University Press, earned honorable mention for the 2016 Gregory Bateson Book Prize. In 2018, Professor Wool won an NSF Career Award to support her second book project, tentatively titled Socialities of Care. Uh, Matthew Redborn is the Root Distinguished Professor of English at James Madison University. He works in 19th century American <coughs> literature, theater, and performance history, and medical humanities. His work has been supported by Harvard University, the Library Company of Philadelphia, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, the American Antiquarian Society, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. His first book, Pioneer Performances, Staging the Frontier, was published by Oxford University Press in 2012. He is currently finishing a second book under advanced contract from Oxford University Press called Minding the Body, the Animate Body in Antebellum American Literature. And his talk today is going to be uh, drawn from that book. Um, and finally, David Hayes. And uh, you know, I sort of joked about this, but on his website he writes, David Hayes was a neuroscientist, um, and he still is, but was a neuroscientist exploring the impact of pleasant and unpleasant events on brain and behavior. But he is now a research and policy officer at the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. He was previously a visiting professor at Union College, and he's published numerous articles in journals like Neuroscience, Neuroanatomy, and Human Brain Mapping. Um, I'd just like you all to welcome um, the three of our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi. Um, so it's very, it's a total pleasure to be here, um, in part because this is a project, it's, I have four projects and this is the only one that doesn't have funding, and so it's the one that I like never get to work on, so I was really excited. Um, it's a book project that's also called Homunculus Revolts. Um, and before I jump into the paper, I just I have a couple of access copies. So if anybody wants to read along while they're listening, um, do you just want to raise your hand and you can have a copy? Okay. And could someone? Oh, I only have two. Do you? Yeah. Thanks. Um, Okay, and I'll say also, this is, you know, the project is very much kind of in flux and in, in process, and so I'm looking forward to the conversation because I can extract um, all of the wonderful insights and exploit your intellectual labor for my own benefits. Um, okay, so as a standard feature of anatomy, physiology, and neuroscience textbooks, the image of the cortical homunculus will be familiar to students of medicine, cognitive science, neurology, and other fields. Others may recognize it from its frequent appearance in popular science accounts of human motor and sensory processes. Whichever iteration of this figure you've encountered, it is descended from the figures created by Wilder Penfield, the visionary mid-20th century neurologist whose work was critical to the shaping of neurology as it emerged as a field of medicine in its own right. The cortical homunculus is based on correlated data from 163 cases in which Penfield and his team used direct electrical stimulation of the cortices to explore the localization of various motor and sensory functions in anesthetized but fully awake patients who were undergoing surgical removal of invasive brain tumors or scar tissue, which was causing unmanageable epileptic seizures or other symptoms. 
As Katja Gunther has noted, these, ex these explorations of localization were at first only clinical, but as the evidence began to mount, Penfield noted an emerging significance for brain research that if correlated and standardized according to a standardized map uh, of anatom anatomical landmarks of the brain rather than this patient's brain or that patient's brain, they might yield a standardized map of the localizations of bodily, and mo and of bodily motion and sensation. The result with which we are most familiar is this figure, which appeared in the 1954 book, The Cerebral Cortex of Man, which Penfield co-authored with his collaborator, Theodore Rasmussen. Comprised of a vertically bisected human figure marked as male, most notably by his genitals, the two halves of the homunculus are splayed over the motor and sensory cortices, respectively. His features stretch, skewed, and reoriented to represent the general localization and amount of cortical real estate those features take up in the brain. The two halves are subtly different, but they also correspond in many ways. The feet of both figures dangle down into the longitudinal fissure. Their torsos lay extended across the gyri with arms outreached overhead. Both figures are decapitated, their faces relocated and inverted just beyond the reach of their extended thumbs of the massive hands, hands that are roughly the size of the whole torso. The faces are also massive, bigger even than the hands. They both have huge lips. The motor homunculus in particular has huge, bulging eyes. Their tongues reside outside the faces altogether, resting beneath the chin. The sensory homunculus has a penis and scrotum that dangle down beneath the toes of his dramatically elongated foot. The homunculus has been, ca been called grotesque, monstrous, horrific, a parade of stigmatizing adjectives, which is one of the two senses I intend to evoke in titling this project Homunculus Revolts. Katja Gunther notes that, while she in, with, that when she indicated her interest in this figure to William Findell, who's the uh, former director of the Montreal Neurological Institute that, William, um, that Walter Penfield founded, Findell said, ah, that silly thing. When I first presented on this project, Lawrence Kermeyer, who's the director of social and transcultural psychiatry at McGill, um, uh, he said that the the homunculus really had minimal significance and dismissed it as merely a heuristic. And in lots of different ways, this figure has been dismissed as purely artistic, as little more than a mnemonic device, or as just a map. But, map, but brain maps are sedu seductive, both uh, for those of us who are culturally surrounded by them and for the cartographers themselves. As TED talking neuroscientist V.S. Ramachandran put it, a neurologist might conclude that God is a cartographer. He must have an inordinate fondness for maps, for everywhere you look in the brain, maps abound. Perhaps it is not the cartographer, it seems, who makes the maps, but God himself who puts them in the brain. The correspondence of map and territory is, of course, tricky stuff. And the more abstraction gives way to closer and more exact correspondence, the more likely there is to be an effacement of the difference between the two. We need only think of Jorge Luis Borges on exactitude in science to remind ourselves of the absurdities of such an effort. Unless we find ourselves naturalizing the cartographic imaginary and its ontological narrowness, we might think of Lan Lee's work on the distinctions between anatomical body maps, which fix and foreclose our understanding of the body's invisible anatomy through correspondence with the visible anatomy, and Chinese two, which diagrammatically open up interpretation of the invisible without anatomically pinning it down. Which is to say that maps, like the homunculus, are not the only diagrammatic way to chart invisible anatomy, and that they, become, and that they come with a particular set of epistemological and ontological baggage. With this problem of map and territory, I mean to index both the broader issue of representation and reality and representation as reality, and the more specific issue of graphic neuroscientific representations of the brain, which are treated as the brain itself, thereby erasing the multiple practices of inscription and forms of social and technical and political mediation that are involved in translating brains into images. And of course, um, this contributes to a, a widespread fetishization of the brain image itself, this kind of reading of the brain 
uh, image as the brain itself, something that Rainer Rapp has been writing about in the context of um, disability um, in, the, in the US. So while I do think that the homunculus is kin to the broader family of brain maps and images, for my purposes here, I want to think of him as a figure rather than a map at all. And I do this because my aim is to read him as a culturally loaded rendering of the neurological subject, a particular kind of representation, a representation that, like all representations, could have been otherwise, and whose particularities have something to tell us about normative biomedical bodies and the imbrication, in particular, of gender, disability, and race in their renderings. In part, I'm thinking here of what Ellen, Ellen Samuels calls fantasies of identification, by which she means fantasies that forms of social difference, particularly race, gender, and disability, can be identified in the body through the mobilization of scientific, often medical, processes of certification, what she calls biocertification. Wilder Penfield also wrote of the homunculus as a figurine, and wrote of the two halves as twinned, playing on the literal meaning of the homunculus, little man, in personifying him. But these personifications are hardly affectionate. Penfield also called, called the homunculus grotesque, and in an exchange with his colleague Sir Francis Walsh, who called the, hom the homunculus a rather deceptive monstrosity, and suggested Penfield consider doing away with it by infanticide, Penfield replied, I would kill the damn thing if I could. It is something of this sense of the homunculus as a simultaneously standardized but problematic and troubling figure that I think makes him so productive. So what is it that the homunculus has to say to us about the inscription of social difference? Perhaps most obviously there is his gender. In nearly every representation, the homunculus is male. In addition to his penis, which is sometimes omitted in images that are intended for mixed company, like this image from Wikipedia, his body is lithe and absent of breasts and the distribution of fat which characterize normatively female bodies. Medical sociologist Cassandra Crawford describes this as part of what she calls the unacknowledged imbrication of maleness with the primordial brain-based body. And it fits well with Liz Gross's oft-quoted observation that, quote, the body that is generally addressed by neuro and psychophysiology is implicitly the male body. In 1979, a Scientific American article represented a feminized motor homunculus, a femuncula we might call her, whose gender is most clearly represented by the presence of a breast and bangs. Since then, some illustrators have offered femuncula in place of homunculus, simply swapping out the external genitals. While more recently, some have also attempted to explore a specifically female somatosensory cortical anatomy, leading to the proposition of a specifically female hermunculus, as one set of authors puts it. But these efforts to remediate the generic maleness of the neurological body leave much to be desired. They uncritically reproduce the discontents of brain theories of localization. In hinging gender to genitals, they double down on the biologization of a binary model of gender. And in suggesting a single normative female cortical anatomy, they participate in the pathologization of difference. What's more, while the standard feminist critique of such generic maleness remains fundamental, it also obscures the imbrications of race, disability, and gender, which are essential to understanding how exactly normativity is coordinated. To understand that, I turn to a point I made before, that the figure of the homunculus could have been otherwise, that his particularities have something to tell us about the imbrication of race, gender, and disability in the inscription of the neurological subject. As it happens, as some of you, I imagine, know, the homunculus was otherwise. The iconic 1954 version, which seems to be the progenitor of all of those that followed, is in fact the twinned offspring of an earlier ancestor. In 1937, Wilder Penfield and his colleague Edwin Baldry published an article called Somatic, Motor, and Sensory Representation in the journal Brain. This article would become the basis for Penfield's 1954 book, in which this more familiar homunculus first appeared, but the article offered a rather different homunculus, the one that Penfield called a grotesque creature. A single combined somatosensory homunculus, the figure is almost comical. 
Its decapitated, inverted body is pot belly and splayed. I'm always tempted to think of it as spatchcocked, like a chicken. It is inver its inverted head floats in the center with large hooded eyes and an inexplicably gap-toothed grin. Below is a large disembodied tongue, and at the bottom, a separate image of a view into the mouth with a dangling uvula. The figure's maleness is suggested primarily by the absence of breasts, but the genitalia are not pictured, so this figure is rendered both male and emasculated. Both this original 1937 homunculus and his better known twin offspring were illustrated by Hortense Cantley. While I have yet to unearth the correspondence between, Cortense and, uh, between uh, Cantley and Penfield, which I imagine must exist, about either drawing, for my purposes here, I'm actually more interested in how this figure speaks to us than how it was authored. In particular, how this figure might invite us to critical readings of the normativity of the neurological subject that move in slightly different ways than the more standard feminist critiques of that subject's maleness. We might still say that this representation entails an erasure of the experiential body of the female subject. This is true, but it also rubs up against the presence of Penfield's female as well as male patients who quite literally speak in the text that surrounds these, image, these images. For example, MG, a girl age 21, describes one sensory response in her hands and feet as like going to sleep. She, like all the other patients, is relied on as a collaborator, and in fact, Penfield credits them collectively as what he calls the other authors of his 1954 book. What's more, the maleness of this figure can hardly be said to be normative, both because of his emasculation and because that normative maleness, the normative maleness of the neuro and psychophysiology that we're familiar with critiquing, is normative because it is also coded as white and fit. This figure is not quite those things. His whiteness is complicated by the particular distortions of his face, some of which are guided by Penfield's observations, like the large hands and eyes and lips and elongated upper lip. But when combined together, these figures of the homunculus overlap with those of 19th century anthropometry, physiognomy, and anthropologies of race, which are very much still with us, and in which the supposedly simian characteristics are made to be indicators of a great evolutionary and civilizational chain of intellectual and racial types. Some have also called him Gollum-like, invo invoking the originally protective figure of Jewish fable who has been co-opted by popular culture and anti-Semitic paranoia as a monstrous figure absent of intelligence and will. Just as a conventional effort to correct the maleness of the homunculus leads us into perilous territory by reifying, biologizing, and standardizing a normative femininity, so with conventional efforts to address his presumed whiteness. That is, while anatomical illustrations of biomedicine, including other brain charts from Pen Penfield's work and most homunculi, are indeed coded as white, and sometimes through facial features and sometimes through skin color, the attempt to remediate the presumed whiteness of the homunculus by, for example, altering skin tone or eye color lead to images that represent, however accidentally, a reification of racist anthropometry. Hang on. I'm missing one. Oh, no. Okay. There we go. That is, while large lips, eyes, hands, feet, and genitals, and an elongated upper lip are essential features of the homunculus based on Penfield's brain mapping data, those features also cannot help but participate in a racist vernacular of medical and scientific representations of blackness as anatomy and physiognomy, which are key to fantasies of racial identification a vernacular which is amplified rather than criticized in the attempt to diversify a figure whose whiteness is already imperfect. Other features of the original 1937 homunculus are less essential to Penfield's project. His pot belly, for example, along with his gap-toothed smile, pug nose, and heavily hooded eyes. These features evoke racializing 19th century caricatures of Irish immigrants that appeared in satire cartoons participating in the same logics of evolution racial superior, and racial superiority that underwrite the fantasies of racial identification of blackness, 
these cartoons often compare uh, cartoons that obviously I'm not going to show here. Um, uh, they often compare the Irish to apes and represent them as well beyond the charm cir circle of Anglo-Saxon whiteness, which is also coded as a class distinction. The figures misshapen and missing teeth evoke a related specters of class and hygiene, both oral and mental, and the sordid legacies of Malthusianism, criminology, and the like. In other words, the homunculus is a normed figure in the sense that he is the standardized outcome of aggregated data, but he is far from normative. He participates in, a racialized, in racialized visual vernaculars that are outside the white-coded space of normative masculinity. What's more, in evoking his imperfect whiteness in the form of his monstrousness, his potential Jewishness, maybe blackness or, blackness or Irishness, I have also noted the ways that the degradation of these categories entails their cognitive disablement through tropes of intelligence, which are tied simultaneously to race and class. In this way, the homunculus unwittingly participates in what Mel Chen calls cognition's racialization. Chen notes that those, this is, uh, that those who embody race and class privilege can make what they call cognitive missteps with no serious penalties. The example discussed in the text is uh, Dan Quayle. While those who do not embody that privilege, such as the beneficiaries of the United ne Negro College Fund, in the example Chen discusses, are what they call habitually produced as possible sites of deficiency, rather than as people who have historically struggled for access to a particular kind of cognitive elaboration tied to class and race privilege. Chen refers here to profiles of race, gender, and labor that produce variable body-mind distributions that are keyed to their proper place in a hierarchy. The undermining of the homunculus's whiteness comes along with a racialization that is also a dumbing down, a cognitive impairing of the universal little man in the brain who is, after all, and somewhat ironically, all body and no thought. So I want to end by following this thread of cognition's racialization backward from the homunculus to one of his earliest ancestors, a woman named Mary Rafferty. Though her case appears with some frequency in bioethics texts, I was unaware of her until I began working on this project. When I encountered the moment of her contribution to the homunculus in a paper from 1874, a moment Wilder Penfield also describes at some length in his 1937 article, I found myself gripped by horror and on the verge of tears. Her story is not unlike many others in the annals of medicine, people who, by virtue of their social and political renderings of disability, race, religion, poverty, or provenance, became targets of the authorized violence in the form of medical testing and experimentation. I will not rehearse the entirety of what Bartholow, the doctor in this case, did to her, both to spare you the encounter that I had with the terrible details, as well as to, sim to avoid simply reproducing their violence. But I will offer those details that allow me to gesture in a different direction, one in which we might think about what happened to Mary Rafferty with a greater care. In 1874, Rafferty was a 30-year-old domestic servant, born in Ireland and living in Cincinnati, where she developed a two-inch ulcer in her skull, likely from florid epithelial cancer. She was treated at the Good Samaritan Hospital there for some months, either as an inpatient or outpatient, it's not clear, until her case came to the notice of Dr. Roberts Bartholo, a notable local physician and faculty member of the Medical College of Ohio. Two citations of her case, one that comes from Penfield, state that she was working as a domestic in Bartholo's own household, although the evidence for this is not entirely clear. The only image of her is one haunting engraving depicting the back of her ulcerated head, which I will also not show. Part of my effort in the larger project is to give space to her life beyond the bounds of this medical case. Following her initial consultation with him, Bartholo proceeded over six separate sessions to kill Mary Rafferty, or at the very least horrifyingly hasten her death, by probing her brain with electrodes. The toll that the sessions took on her is acute, cumulative, and painfully obvious. At one of the stimulations during a third session, Bartholo writes, her countenance exhibits great distress, and she began to cry. 
The sessions continue, and three terrifying days later, Mary Rafferty is dead. When Wilder Penfield writes about the case, he is clearly disturbed by it. But he also recognizes this as the first use of direct electrical stimulation on the cornices of the, human, of the conscious human brain, and thereby as an important moment in the history of which he considered himself and the homunculus to be part. In his 1874 paper describing her case, Barcelo wrote that Mary Rafferty was, quote, rather feeble-minded, a category tied to a whole range of cognitive conditions, one with an intimate relation to institutionalization and eugenics, and which is often seamlessly translated into the contemporary category of cognitive or intellectual disability. As the case has been taken up in bioethics, it has become an object lesson in questions of research and consent around cognitive capacity. But the historiography of feeble-mindedness, including critical work in disability studies, shows that the construction of feeble-mindedness, oh, I'm also missing a slide there, sorry. Um, the construction of feeble-mindedness as a category of degeneracy is inseparable from other such categories, particularly those of race and class, suggesting that rather than a seamless translation of feeble-minded into cognitive disability, what is required is a reading of the coordination of cognition with, as Mel Chen puts it, profiles of race, gender, and labor that produce variable body-mind distributions that are keyed to their proper place in a hierarchy. In 1874, Bill wrote that despite her rather feeble mind, Rafferty is cheerful in manner and smiles freely and easily. This is surprising, given the advanced state of her disease for which she had been seeking care for as many as 13 months by the time she was seen by Bartholow. Pain is experienced, he reports, but it is not very acute. Rafferty's cheerful disposition upon presenting herself in such a state to a man who may have been her employer and at the very least was a notable figure of medical authority, a wealthy and powerful white man described by others as having a chilly, reserved, and uninviting manner, must certainly say more about the affective disciplining of domestic service and gendering performances of 19th century medicine than her level of pain or her state of health. Mary Rafferty's affectively disciplined performance of patienthood is intertwined with her position as a classed and racialized subject as an Irish immigrant domestic worker. While the hole in her skull was in all likelihood caused by her cancer, Rafferty herself is said to have attributed the change attributed it to the chafing of a piece of whalebone in the wig that she wore to cover a scarred patch of her scalp while no, where no hair grew. This was the result of having fall, fallen into the fire as an infant, likely in the home that she shared with her mother and at least some of her four si siblings and perhaps her father. This life-threatening accident gestures at the precarity of Irish working class domestic life in the time of the Great Potato Famine when Rafferty was born a precarity that she was presumably attempting to navigate both by wearing a painful prosthetic and by becoming a domestic in America. Thinking of the racialization of cognition, we might ask why her apparent feeble-mindedness, the indications of which are not stated, is not read as a symptom of her brain tumor, or how that designation fits with the fact that, as Barcelo writes, Mary returned correct replies to all questions, that she does not hesitate for words. We might remember that feeble-mindedness is a designation ready at hand to describe the cognitive mode of an Irish working class immigrant woman. I point this out not to suggest that her cognitive capacities have been misdiagnosed, although perhaps they have, but rather to point out the way that the designation of her mind as rather feeble is hardly straightforward, and that this clinical in interpolation cannot be read outside the normative expectations of affect, intelligence, commun and communicative capacity, which Mary Rafferty was subject to. In describing her case in his own 1937 article, in claiming her as an ancestor to the homunculus, Wilder Penfield wrote that Mary Rafferty had been made to wear her wig. This imperative characterization seems especially important, given that, as Raff, given that Rafferty's use of the prosthetic must have facilitated her basic social and economic livelihood as a racialized working class immigrant woman in the late 19th century urban United States, an era that gave rise to the US's ugly laws, and that is notorious for its deeply disciplinary cultivation of women's bodies. 
I am further struck by the violence of this imperative when I consider that the prosthetic which Mary Rafferty was made to wear caused her such discomfort that she suspected it had quite literally worn away her skull. In writing of cognition's racialization, Melchen invites us to ask the question, who gets to begin in the eyes of others with the body, and who gets to begin in the eyes of others with the mind? The homunculus speaks to us of the ways that this question, a question about the inscription of social difference, lingers in the charting of cortical anatomy. His imperfect whiteness, his imperfect masculinity, his all body and no thoughtness, he could hardly be further from that anatomical ideal, from the normative masculinity of the body of biomedicine that we are so used to critiquing. Thinking of his ancestors, not only Mary Rafferty, but the 163 others whose disabilities were essential to his conception, whose seizures and scars and symptoms and articulate bodies and words were the literal stuff of Penfield's inscriptions as he lay little numbered paper tickets directly on their brains to indicate the location of each electrical stimulation while his stenographer recorded their responses, their descriptions of auras, of tingling, of sudden memories, of the feeling of falling asleep. Thinking of all of these ancestors, all of whom were definitionally pathologized and whose pathologies, whose disabilities, became the stuff of a normative and universal rendering of cortical localization, it is tempting to say that the homunculus crips the very concept of a normative anatomical body, one iteration of which he is supposed to be. And this, I think, is his potential to open new possibilities for thinking simultaneously about gender, race, class, and disability in the context of neuroscientific knowledge, new ways of thinking about the fantasies of identification in which neuroscience participates. And here is the other second meaning I intend when I say homunculus revolts, that if we think about the specific reasons that this figure is read as grotesque, as monstrous, as hideous, a parade of stigmatizing adjectives, also regularly and historically used against people with disabilities in a practice of stigmatization that is also always color-coded by the degradation of non-whiteness. If we marry the historical story of his birth with a cultural reading of his significance, we may find something of a revolution, a radical turn that might generate new lines of critique that understands something other than, normative, than normativity as central to the making of the neurological subject. Um, Zoe, thank you. We're going to hold questions, I think, till after both Matt and Dave speak. So, Matthew Rubin. Um, I felt slightly sheepish about not having a PowerPoint. Um, and then, Zoe, your PowerPoint made me think, wow, it would be hard to follow that amazing PowerPoint um, with anything close to approximating that. So I'll just have words uh, for today, but words are important. Um, and uh, let me just do a kind of really po positive, generative sort of things we can talk about in common here. Okay, let's start with the sort of premise. Um, there is little doubt that doctors helped kill George Washington, the father of the country at the dawn of the 19th century. Retired from the presidency and tending to the affairs of Mount Vernon, Washington had gone out on his property to mark trees for cutting on a wet, snowy Friday, December 13, 1799. When he returned inside, his loyal attendant and secretary, Tobias Lear, observed to him that he was wet, but Washington replied that, quote, his great coat had kept him dry. However, as Lear noted, quote, his neck appeared to be wet, and the snow hanging on his hair, he came to dinner without changing his dress. While he appeared to be fine that evening, later that night he complained of tightness and hoarseness in his throat and felt debilitated. His friend, Dr. Elijah Cullen Craig, was summoned, and later, as the disease worsened, two other doctors were called for as well, Dr. Discavis Richard Brown from Port Tobacco and Dr. Elijah Dick of Alexandria. Craig and Brown were what were called regular doctors, um, both graduates of the University of Edinburgh, the premier medical school in the Western world. When Dick studied under Dr. Benjamin Rush at the University of Pennsylvania, 
premier uh, professional medical school in the US, Rush instructed students in the same regular methodologies and therapeutics that he himself had learned in Edinburgh. To treat the illness itself, as these regular doctors insisted, involved phlebotomy or bleeding the patient, and bleed him they did with abandon. Over the course of 24 hours, they bled the general a total of four times, drawing more than 80 ounces of blood from his body, though some estimates put it closer to 108 ounces. To put this in perspective, a healthy middle-aged man has roughly 192 ounces of blood coursing through his body at any one time. And as the American College of Surgeons in their current advanced trauma life support guide states, losing more than 40% of your blood will produce hypovolemic shock causing major organs to shut down and leading almost uncertainly to brain death. If regular doctors were not directly responsible for killing George Washington on December 14, 1799, then it is safe to say that their therapeutics, stemming from a particular understanding of the body and its relationship to the mind, contributed to the death of the father of the country in the waning hours of the 18th century. Bleeding a patient stemmed from the regular doctor's notion of what David M. Morins calls heroic depletion. Intense bloodletting provided a ready-made way of demonstrating that the profession of a regular medical practitioner was not merely legitimate, but in drawing more than half of Washington's blood, also heroic. Regular medical practitioners like Craig, Brown, and Dick, doctors in the Edinburgh tradition, tended to measure their effectiveness by the amounts of blood withdrawn drugs administered, and symptoms altered. Bleeding a patient, therefore, did not treat the disease as such. Rather, bleeding a patient until he or she passed out or until the body purged its bowels or stomach assured the patient and his family, as Charles E. Rosenberg argues, that something was being done. There was, in other words, a rational, empirical correlation drawn between withdrawing enough blood to change the aspect of a patient and the idea that whatever disease was afflicting that patient was being treated. Bloodletting became ipso facto a kind of cure, if by cure one means nothing more than a change in the patient's state. Heroic depletion was premised, as the medical historian John Harlan Warner writes, quote, on the belief that the most prevailing diseases were overstimulated. While in principle diseases could be sthenic or asthenic, nearly all those the physicians encountered were sthenic, tipping the patient's vital balance to a dangerously overexcited condition. Drawing on Paracelsian notions of bodily balance, being what defined health, regular doctors like Craig, Brown, and Dick saw disease as being about a systematic imbalance caused by overstimulation. Thus, to cure any disease, they merely had to reduce the stimulation and bloodletting provided them with the perfect, perfect means to do so. The blood that ran out of the senseless patient's arm was merely the material evidence of the body's own insensibility, as well as of the regular doctor's mental power over that body. Regular medicine was thus premised on a Cartesian ontology that divided what Christopher Castiglia refers to as the bodily muscular from the mental nervous an ontology that understood the body as separate and distinct from the mind, even if the two had an intimate relationship to each other. A singular premise guiding Western science and clinical medicine, argue medical anthropologists Nancy Shepard Hughes and Margaret M. Locke, is its commitment to a fundamental opposition between spirit and matter, mind and body, and underlying this real and unreal. This ontology not only divided the mind from the body, but also organized their relationship hierarchically, with the mind positioned above and ruling over the body. Consider the ideas of Benjamin Rush, the most important theorist and practitioner of early American regular medicine, as well as the mentor of Dick. Rush's regular medical discourse saw the source of disease as always a matter of the system's overstimulation, which presents itself as a fever. There is but one exciting cause of fever, Rush proclaims, and that is stimulus. Heat, alternating with cold, marsh and human miasmata, contagions and poisons of all kinds, intemperance, passions of the mind, bruises, burns, and the like, all act by a stimulating power only in producing fever. Overstimulation, or what Rush called morbid excitement, is thus to be cured in only one way, by bleeding and purging the patient's body in order to regain equilibrium. 
Moreover, bleeding, as Rush confides to his reader, is, quote, under the command of a physician. He may bleed when and where he pleases, and may suit the quantity of blood he draws exactly to the condition of his patient's system. Rush's attention to exactitude belies his contentment in commanding the patient's body. His medical practice not only reinforces his role as a professional practicing heroic medicine, but it also codifies a notion that this heroic agency was localized in the doctor's trained, educated mind, and that the body, in this case the patient's, was merely an object to be acted upon by that mind. Given the severity of this kind of heroic treatment, it should come as no surprise that this regular medical practice that privileged bleeding should come under attack. And one of the most vociferous and persistent critiques of it sprung from William Cobbett, an 18th century muckraking journalist who, on the very same day that Washington died, was in court defending himself from a charge of libel for calling Benjamin Rush a fraud in his practice of bloodletting a form of death deal. Cobbett had called Rush a quack, in fact, and his bloodletting a source of dread for his patients and used the death of Washington to illustrate his point. More importantly, he used his journal, the Rush Light, which is say for a second, is about as trolling a trolly thing as you can get because it is devoted entirely to taking Benjamin Rush down and ran for several issues, the Rush line, to suggest that there might be alternatives to the dangerous regular medical therapeutics that killed Washington. He quotes glowingly, for example, from an anonymous letter he received that critiqued Rush's system. It countered Rush's belief in the all-powerful doctor's mind ruling over the inanimate patient's body by stating that, quote, nature is the physician's kind directress, and that she cautions the physician against bleeding by showing that it is always prejudicial, <coughs> often fatal. Cobbett uses this missive to offer an antidote to the purgatives and bleedings that define regular medical practice by pointing to nature as a better healer than doctors. Importantly, he also buttresses this belief in nature's healing power by revealing that there is, quote, a power existing in the animal body that can fight any disease that afflicts the patient. While Cobbett's vituperative tone makes his work unique, there are many theorists who also offered a profound critique of regular medical practice and who also underscored the healing power that exists in the body. In the wake of Washington's death, alternative medical practices, or irregular medicine as it was called, grew just as rapidly as regular medicine did. Different forms of irregular medicine, such as mesmerism, phrenology, homeopathy, flourished, offering patients a renewed faith in nature to combat illness and a newfound belief in the power of their bodies more generally. In this sense, Washington's death might be thought of as a kind of crisis in the way Thomas Kuhn describes it that fundamentally shifts the paradigm of thought. As we can mark out, and we can mark out this new paradigmatic understanding by attending to the way alternative medicine offered a different ontology, a differently imagined relationship between the mind and the body than that espoused by Rush and by Washington's doctors. To get a sense of this different and paradigm shifting ontology, consider, consider the irregular medical discourse called Thompsonianism that flourished from the end of the 18th century onward. This was a discourse that mobilized exactly Cobbett's blistering account of how regular doctors bled Washington to death as an advertisement for and justification of irregular medical alternatives to the deadly therapeutics of regular medicine. Developing at almost the same time as Washington was dying, this discourse derived from the theories of a farmer named Samuel Thompson and was based on a system of botanical medicine. Thompson's practice centered on the efforts of its practitioners to fight disease by raising the natural heat of the patient's body. People flocked to Thompsonianism not just because its therapeutics avoided bloodletting and stressed, na stressed natural remedies, but also because these therapeutics, as we saw in Cobbett's attack on Rush, were based on the idea of a body that refused to submit to the violent mastering of the doctor's mind. To illustrate this more clearly, consider the case of fever. Recall that for Benjamin Rush, fever was a sign of the body's overstimulation. All disease, in fact, was a matter of fever, 
Rush stated, and since fever was the morbid excitement of the body, it needed to be saved by the heroic mind of the regular doctor, who would reduce this excitement by extracting some of the patient's blood. Thompson, by contrast, argued that fever, quote, was caused by the efforts which nature makes to throw off disease, and therefore ought to be aided in its cause and treated as a friend, not as an enemy, as is the practice of the physician. Rather than bleeding and purging the patient to diminish the heat of a fever as Rush demands, in other words, Thompson argues that the medical practitioner should aim to, quote, restore heat, since natural heat, that is heat stemming from the body itself, works to combat illness and maintain health. While striking a different tone, Thompson's lionizing of nature as a source of a cure for the body aligns with Cobbett's similar investment in nature's healing powers. Like Cobbett, Thompson uses this idea not simply to offer a different and better therapeutic model, but also to advance a different ontology than the one Rush embraced. Rush saw the mind as dominant over the body, while Thompson saw the body as equal to or even dominant over the mind. If the mind was central to the body's proper functioning in regular medicine, with the doctor being the representation of the mind that controlled the objectified body, then in a regular medical practice, quote, the stomach is the deposit from which the whole body is supported, as Thompson argued. Privileging the stomach over the mind, Thompson not only undercuts the hierarchical mind over body ontology that regular medicine espoused, but he also suggests a different ontological figuration of the mind's relationship to the body. The body produces animating heat, and through the stomach, generates its own kind of agency independent of the mind's directives. I think, therefore, I am becomes, in a sense, you are what you eat, in Thompson's ruminations. Using this ontological debate about the nature of consciousness as a prod, I want to use my remaining time here to begin to respond to the challenge that Paul Gilmore levels in his general critique of cognitive literary studies. As Gilmore astutely notes, most cognitive literary critics, quote, maintain something akin to a first-generational cognitive science stance in positing the mind as largely disembodied and hardwired. For such critics, in other words, consciousness involves what I've been calling the mind over body ontology, the mind is distinct from and superior to the body that it controls. Consciousness is the providence of the mind and the mind alone, while the body is understood, according to Gilmore, as simply, quote, the product of social practices. In this ontology, the mind thus creates the consciousness of the subject, while the body is an inanimate object devoid of agency. This is the Cartesian cogito leg legitimized and authorized by grounding it in cognitive science's ability to tell the whole story of our conscious existence. As cognitive sciences, scientists such as Bruce Wexler, Mark Lakoff, Mark Johnson, Antonio Damasio have argued, however, the problem with this ontology is the way it tends at best to obscure and at worst to erase the fact that the body's experiences help shape our neural circuits. That is, while Lakoff and Johnson admit that we are reasoning creatures, as Descartes suggests, the very structure of reason itself comes from the details of our embodiment. In fact, our consciousness, quote, begins with and depends crucially upon our bodies, which have been shaped by both evolution and experience. By understanding consciousness and the ontology of the mind-body relationship as conditioned by and built upon the experience of the body at different times and under different circumstances, these studies encourage us to craft what Gilmore, following Alan Richardson, calls a neural historicism. Unlike traditional cognitive studies, this mode of analysis focuses on the way the specific experiences of a particular place over a certain period might fundamentally shape the brains of living individuals. I want to suggest, therefore, that the competing discursive threads spun after the death of Washington can be woven together to reveal a complex neural historicism structuring the history of medicine and the debates about consciousness during the more than half century after Washington's death. In this sense, my argument builds on the more recent post-human critical turn that opens a space to develop the idea of the conscious body. As, theory, as theorists such as Carrie Wolfe and Jane Bennett have argued, 
the critical energy of posthumanism comes from the way that it actively works to interrogate ontological distinctions between humans and animals, persons and objects, masters and slaves, matter and non-matter. In its rejection of standard categories of meaning and being, posthumanism opens up the possibility of imagining new forms of consciousness informed by new experiences that erode the distinctions between the mind as subject and the body as object. This materialist ontology, as Jane Bennett calls it, eschews the life-matter binary and affirms a, quote, lively materiality that resists confinement to a stable hierarchy. Ultimately, the debate over Washington's death not only reinforced interrogations of ontology, but also gestures towards a new definition of personhood that takes as its premise the permeable boundaries between the mind and the body made visible and the notion of the body's lively materiality. In this way, I take up the challenge that Bennett levels at scholars, quote, to conceive of our bodily materials as lively and self-organizing rather than as passive or mechanical means under the direction of something non-material, that is, an active soul or mind. To meet this challenge, I lean on what Sharon Cameron calls impersonality. For Cameron, impersonality, quote, is not the negation of the person, but rather a penitent penetration through or falling outside of the boundary of the human particular. Impersonality disrupts elementary categories we suppose to be fundamental to specifying human distinctiveness. In its, quote, unbinding from the personal, impersonality creates the effect not so much of neutralization, as if all categories of being are meaningless, but rather, quote, a bafflement or haunt of the traditional ontological categories that define the conscious self, a bafflement that allows other categories of consciousness to exist in the body. In outlining the debates surrounding Washington's death and the way it brings to the surface competing ontological claims, his death epitomizes the way impersonality can smudge the crisp distinctions between mind and body in traditional ontological figurations allowing a new form of mind-in-body consciousness to develop. These debates about medical practices and about the baffling notions of consciousness they entail filled the pages of medical pamphlets, almanacs, and treaties, treaties in the years after Washington's death. But they were just as prevalent, if largely ignored, in the literary works of the same period. Since the events leading to and precipitating out of Washington's death were not inscribed with certainty, and the implicit distinction between the mind over body or the mind in body ontological models of consciousness could not be decided without doubt, they raised questions that go beyond what could have been answered in 1799. That is why the ambiguity of Washington's death is so important. The debates swirling around it pose a set of questions involving two competing ontological models that undergirded the debate taken up by a number of future artists in the 19th century who attempted to clarify this ambiguity. This is to say that in blurring the line between literary and medical experimentation, artists engage in what Sari Altschuler calls imaginative experimentation. Quote, the various ways in which doctors and writers use their imaginations to craft, test, and implement their theories of health and the role literary forms played in developing that work. Novels, plays, short stories, visual art, biographical narrative, and poetry, all of these varied forms of literary expression became laboratories for working out, revising, and enlarging the definitions of consciousness in the 19th century. Much ink has been spilled over the past few decades in describing, exploring, and critiquing the way that the body has been represented by a range of artists in the 19th century. Samuel Otter's Mevel's Anatomies and Michael Moon's Disseminating Whitman, for example, expertly mined the way the body was represented by Mevel and Whitman, respectively. These scholarly works, like other studies that focus on the body in antebellum literature, tend to deploy a heuristic model of the body derived from the cultural histories and philosophical understandings of Michel Foucault, mm -hmm. a model that might be usefully condensed to the idea of the body as text, or the idea, as Foucault argues in Nietzsche genealogy history, that the, quote, body is the inscribed surface of events. 
In this model, power relations are inscribed in the body. They invest it, as Foucault argues, in discipline and punish, mark it, train it, torture it, force it to carry out tasks, to perform ceremonies, to emit signs. The work of the literary critic and cultural historian thus becomes that of reading the way the body is marked by power. Our training as literary critics, which allows us to read a novel, can then be brought to bear on the body, which in Foucault's model emits signs akin to the signs that a novel displays. Nevertheless, to run the risk of stating the obvious, uh, there is a considerable difference between a novel and a body. Bodies can be inscribed or marked, just as a novel is, but bodies can also inscribe and mark other bodies in their environment. Bodies are objects to be read, to be sure, but they are also subjects capable of reading and making sense of the world around them in ways that a novel cannot, except through the subject reading it. Our critical history of reading the body has flourished by treating the body as an object of inquiry, as Foucault argued, but only at the expense of not seeing the body as having agency, as being a subject capable of inquiry itself. As a result, many of our critical interventions have unintentionally reified the same ontological model of animate mind over inanimate body that subtends the regular medical discourse of a figure like Rush. I want to depart from these studies in order to mind the body, that is, to tell a richer story of American literary and artistic history that explores the way the body was inscribed, even as it attends the important ways the conscious body inscribed itself into the world around it. Through their work's entanglement with those discourses, artists change the aesthetics of antebellum narrative, poetry, and dramatic performance so as to deal with an animate body that can inscribe the world around it. By tracing the interplay between competing medical discourses on the one hand and the responses of these writers and performers on the other, I want to use this talk to task us not with telling what Paul Gilmore calls a neural history, but what I want to refer to as a neural literary history of American literature in the antebellum period. That is, by understanding the way the particular experience of the mind-body relationship at certain historical moments inflected the notion of consciousness that various writers explore, I argue how mind in the body changed how an American novel was to be read, probed why Americans acted as they did on stage, and reconceived what constituted the shape and rhythm of American poetry. By historicizing these aesthetic innovations, this approach reveals how the aesthetic could be used to imagine alternative modes of bodily consciousness for people, especially working class laborers, chattel slaves, and women, who are often reduced to and marginalized because of their bodies, which regular medicine practitioners such as Craig, Brown, Dick, and Rush saw as completely inner and inarticulate. The realm of the aesthetic could, could reimagine the body of the manual laborer, for instance, as critiquing rather than mutely supporting the modes of capitalist production. Black bodies were recoded as agents of resistance rather than merely as laboring objects in the slave economy. And women's bodies, often seen as the essence of their identity, were reconceived as agents for healing the wounds of war. In short, artistic work turned the alienated, disenfranchised body into one that thought. By cleaving closely to the experience of these thinking bodies, neural literary history does more than simply illuminate the aesthetic innovations various artists produced as they waded into contemporary debates about consciousness. And also reveals the lived realities of this debate for marginalized bodies. This is as much to say that Cameron's notion of impersonality is not simply a philosophical exercise discreet from the history unfolding around it as she imagines it. Rather, it is a political investment in how bodies experience this impersonality within the context of a fraught history. As we have seen, Washington's death involves what Emory Maul calls ontological politics, the way impersonality and ontological porousness are always already historically conditioned and thus are always already politically invested. In this sense, beginning to tell a neural literary history reveals the way 19th century artists not only made their works aesthetically innovative by minding the body, but by imagining the consciousness of bodies, they also created some of the most politically radical artworks of the 19th century. 
Well, I do not have time to enumerate all of the aesthetic innovations that occurred after 1799, nor to limb the complex political contours of these representations of the conscious body. I'm hoping that this talk can serve as a provocation to reimagine the history of American letters as intimately involved with the history of consciousness, a history made richer and more vibrant for all the ways we should mind the body. Thank you. Um, okay, I, you know, I saw a lot of furious listening, um, <laughs> and I think that probably suggests the degree to which people's minds are racing about the links between these neural racial histories and neural literary histories. Uh, but I'm going to give the neuroscientist, not neuroscientist, the first pass at thinking about this. David. Yeah. David. Thank you, Rishi. Um, if, you, if I start yelling, I'm worried about the mic. If I start yelling, just tell me. Just tell me. It's OK. Um, so right, the neuroscientist, not neuroscientist. Right, so um, I, like you, have so, so many uh, uh, scattered and related thoughts. And so when Rishi invited me, I sort of thought, uh, in fact, I think I actually responded, um, are you sure you want me <laughs> to do this? I wasn't sure what I was getting into. Um, and when I got the papers, I started reading them, and I have to say, I'm not just saying this because I'm here, I never do that, it's awful. Uh, they were a joy to read, and they were even better. As someone said yesterday, they were even better to, to listen to and sort of re-experience them. So it was, a, it was a lot of fun uh, to you know, connect what I know, obviously, with, which is what this is about, right? To connect what I know with uh, stuff I really know nothing about, or, or just I've never thought about, and it's like, oh, this is amazing, yeah, I want to know more about that. Uh, we don't have enough time to do that. But uh, what I want to do is um, first give you a sense of who I am, a little bit more than neuroscientist, not neuroscientist, just a little bit to tell you where I, I'm sort of coming from. Uh, and then I want to do, I want to address the, 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 the papers uh, with some specific comments that I think also uh, traverse both of them in a way, sort of pull out some themes. And um, surprisingly, to me, anyway. Uh, also, I think apply some of these, a lot of these things apply to, to talks given yesterday, not at all about this, right? And so I think that's really interesting. Uh, so I want to do that. And, and then, uh, so it will be a scatterbrained uh, uh, sort of, a, uh, you know, a dump of different ideas that I'll try to pull together and then as quickly as possible, so it's not just me talking for, for a long time, uh, get to you because I think probably you're burning with lots of really interesting questions too. And, and I really want to hear those, so selfishly. Uh, I don't need to hear me talk, I want to hear you talk, so, uh, but I'll do this. Okay, so first off, um, right, neuroscientists, not neuroscientists. So I'm a brain and behavior, these are my cheat sheets, by the way, I don't have a PowerPoint today, but they're cheap. Uh, so I'm a brain and behavior neuroscientist, a clinical neuroscientist uh, by training. I started in, in uh, working with animals, actually animal models, doing some brain mapping, chemically, uh, electrically, um, and, uh, and behaving animals. And then I moved into uh, neuroimaging. So this idea, you've not offended me at all by putting this up, I mean, uh, you, know, it's a, you know, this fetishization of, of brain images, you know, I feel that. I came from outside the field, went in, going like, I think neuroimaging could be a great tool, but also it's a fantastic way to fool people uh, in truckloads. Because it feels, when you look at the image, it's so convincing. It feels like there's something really important there. And like, why do we need anything else? You know, we don't need thought. We don't need humanity. It's philosophy giving us. We've got an image. That's it right there, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's nonsense. So, uh, so I, I like that. Um, I will also say that uh, I, I, I've taught, so I'm a professor of, of neuroscience and psychology, and so this idea of sort of uh, bridging these these worlds and getting students that come from very different backgrounds and trying to sort of in some ways catch them up but get them to the to the core of some really interesting ideas uh, related to you know uh, self and um, consciousness and, and, and bodies and things that we're all talking about here uh, and that's often where I'm trying to get my students to through my sort of lens of, of using you know brains and, and behavior so. Um, so that's where I'm coming from, and, uh, and uh, I will also say that um, 
Rishi started yesterday, started the conference by identifying three themes which I thought was great. Um, so they are, correct me if I'm wrong, sort of jot them down quickly. Uh, so the different, I just sort of summarize them, the differential vulnerability of bodies, uh, so the definitions of what it is to be human and, and the state's role in this. And I think that those are, yeah, I agree. Good, I'm not gonna challenge any of those. Uh, well, not now. Uh, but I'll add some themes uh, that I thought were really interesting, particularly for uh, Zoe and Matthew's favorite, but also I, I saw them interwoven into uh, yesterday's talks as well. I thought that was really interesting. So one is the importance of the mind or, or the soul uh, over the body. This idea that you sort of can feed your soul. Uh, the stomach is king. I thought that was great yesterday. Mm -hmm. it was fantastic. Uh, the idea that you can feed your soul, but you know, don't overfeed it. Um, you know, you have to use moderation here. This is very interesting. Um, but also, there's this paradoxical sort of practical focus uh, that we have on, on the body, and I think that continues today. So we talk about the mind over the body. That's true. There's a lot of talk about that. That's true. And physicians have used it, for instance, to sort of dominate, right? Physicians are very smart, and, and they can sort of, and, and, they, and they can sort of use that as leverage to say, you know, we know we're doing this kind of thing. But really, the practical focus has been strangely uh, on the body in many ways. And, and as I said, I think it continues today, in that we're still very skeptical. So, as I said, I'm a, 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 what I call a brain and behavioral neuroscientist. So I sit sort of in the middle, often, <coughs> uh, from hardcore neuroscientists, whatever they are. Um, you know, give me cells and responses, and uh, people who say, you know, give me, you know, subjectivity, and and you know, don't don't leave out the qualitative, and and then they they and then they clash, you know, and we'll let them go at it, um, and so we're very skeptical, at least in my field, about you know self reports, about talking about subjective states. Uh, we can't quite get at them, so people often reject them entirely, and I think this comes into when we're talking you know, about patients, to patients. Um, the fact that we often overlook that we are all patients um, and that nobody gets through life without being a patient, whatever that means, and I think that's really interesting too. Um, so we tend to sort of believe only uh, and rely mainly on, on signals from what I think is sort of this idea of the sort of a disembrained body, um, which sort of I think is kind of, kind of funny, but I think that we, we do this, and so, uh, Talking about stigmas, which come up quite frequently and tie into this, uh, you know, I often ask students we're in the post-stigma, and you might not know this, but we're we live in a post-stigma era. Where if you ask people, like, you know, it's mental health, you know, is it okay to talk about it? It's like, yeah, it's okay. But sure, there's no stigma associated with that. And then you say, okay, the next time you're sick, would you feel comfortable calling up your boss and telling them that you're having a panic attack, or are you going to lie and say that you you hit your knee or you fell over, and they immediately sort of look at you and go. Yeah, I'm not going to tell someone I had a panic attack. And you go, okay, good. So we're not in the post-stigma era. And it's just that we're, we're talking about it, which is great, uh, but we're, we're, not, uh, we're definitely not there yet. Okay, so that's sort of one sort of theme that's interrelated, I think. Uh, the other one is, is the, the idea that we're dealing, uh, or, you know, dealing or controlling or managing uh, uncertainty and probability. This idea that you know, we love boundaries as humans, we love uh, categories. But, but they, they almost always fail to some degree, and so we're constantly struggling with trying to, and I think this conference speaks to that really nicely, right? People coming together and going, what are you actually saying? I don't know that term, and how does it relate to what, you know, the way that we think, or the way that I think in my, my discipline? So I love that, there's a lot of uh, overlap, and I, I think uh, dealing with this sort of uncertainty. Um, science, I was just saying, scientists are, are uh, are natural philosophers, that's what they started off being labeled, right? And, and whether they want to be or not, but particularly in neuroscience, overwhelmingly, uh, we think, and I have actually evidence for this, you need evidence, right? Um, that they often just reject this idea that they're new philosophy or natural philosophy, so they don't, they only define their terms in, ter in, 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 in an operational sense because they have to in order to get published, but they often think, like, I'm not really making these sort of subjective choices, we're making choices based on, on, on the real world. And none of that is true, um, of course, but I'll tell you, my, my, I've done polls where scientists will sit through an entire lecture having somebody say, I'm, a, I'm trained in philosophy, I'm trained in um, uh, neuroscience, I'm trained in, in even another field, and here's what you're doing, here's how you're doing in philosophy. Um, but uh, at the end, 
I had my colleague fill, you know, hand out a, um, a form, uh, sort of a poll, to say, now do you think, before and after, now do you think that philosophy applies to you, that you're doing philosophy? And they overwhelmingly said, no, we're not, it's not useful. And so, uh, of course, we went and cried about that. Uh, but that, that's sort of, in, in some sense, what we're up against. So, but I think that, that, that ties in there. Also, this idea that ties into that is, uh, I love this, Zoe's concept of sort of feeble-mindedness. It's sort of it's really interesting. Uh, and of course, the elephant in the room, which, which Matthew uh, sort of uh, kind of left in the corner, but pointed out really nicely this idea of consciousness, right? This, this thing, like, what is this? Uh, is, this a one, is this one thing? Is this too, di too difficult for us to understand? Um, you know, you, what is this thing? And, uh, and, and is it really just a place for, for neuroscientists to, to figure this out? Not, not so good job of that. Um, and I'm actually convinced, uh, as you were, it was really nice to see in the paper that you, you're pointing out the, the work of you know, uh, uh, artists and novelists and so many different people who are actually really tackling this issue. Um, whereas um, there are a handful of neuroscientists who are doing it, but, but mostly they're sort of sidestepping the issue. Okay. So another theme I, I, I sort of saw was this idea, the role of the individual, as I sort of mentioned already, this idea of, 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 of the patient. And, um, you know, came up yesterday, you know, who, who, who's to blame? Who, whose responsibility is this, this self-medicine, self-care uh, concept, which is just as relevant today as, as it's been apparently in the past, which I learned about, which is really interesting. And, uh, you know, who's, who's to blame? Who's to get credit for when the, when the doctor helps? Uh, or for when we help ourselves, or, or when we sidestep, uh, you know, um, uh, dis-ease, right? Um, so the role of the physician as a sort of navigator and partner is really just uh, re-emerging again, maybe. I don't know if history is repeating in this sense, but maybe Rishi can, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this, super jump in, you know, but um, this idea of, uh, as a clinical neuroscientist, I am not, don't ask for medical advice, I would probably just give you awful medical advice, but what I've been able to do with family and friends and sort of things is translate. So they'll often come to me and say, I have this thing, you know, and it's often not a brain thing, so why are they asking me, I don't know. I've got this thing on my foot, you know. And, uh, but what I'm able to do, first I say, I don't know about your foot. But then I say, oh, what did the doctor say? Oh, those words, I understand those words, I can help you, like navigate what that means. And navigation has become so key but people seem to generally tune out to even their own bodies. It's really interesting. They're more, they're more in tune with their, which is a generalization, but I see it a lot. They're more in tune with their, you know, with what's happening with their car. You take your car to the mechanic, you say, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna do it? What's actually wrong? When it comes to their body, they say, oh yeah, okay, so just tell me how to fix that. So there's this sort of interesting idea about self-care and I see a lot, I don't know if you see this as well, this idea of people just sort of glossing over, and there's obviously psychological defense mechanisms there, and so forth, we've talked about a little bit. I think that's really interesting. So the role of sort of the patient uh, uh, today, I think is really, really interesting, the role of the individual and, and the, the, the physician or the leader. Uh, okay. So, and then this last one down here, which I sort of already raised, uh, this idea of the sort of academic philosophical views of mind and body uh, and the mind and body in, in practice. So the thing that we all sort of exist and struggle with. And so this, by this I really mean that, so even people here uh, have certain views of, of mind-body distinctions, which may be obviously different depending on the lens that you're, that you're using. Um, but they actually might be completely dissociated from our day-to-day -day actions. So it's really interesting, reminding me a little bit of, of uh, and this is being tied to the, to the papers, it reminded me a little bit of uh, reading Steven Pinker's Blank Slate when it came out years ago. This idea that, you know, the denial of human nature, and I thought, well, like, who's, who's denying human nature? And then he puts out this case saying, like, well, here are all of these examples where we are in our day-to-day, -day, even academically, denying uh, human nature to some degree, and, and, and the mind-body distinction sort of plays a role, a role in that. So I, I think that is also a theme that's really interesting. Um, so we often sort of, for, for instance, parade ourselves too frequently for mistakes, but reward ourselves uh, paradoxically for, for characteristics or events that are beyond our control, again, tying into that idea of dealing with uncertainty and probability. Okay. So just a few sort of questions. Uh, how much time do I? I need a couple more minutes so we can open it up. Okay, sure, yeah, yeah. Oh, are we? Okay. 
So I'll just, I just want to throw out a few sort of questions and just comment on the, on the paper specifically, even though I think that there are, again, those, all those themes seem to sort of flow through here, uh, which, is, which is really great. Um, so I love, uh, just a few things here, I love the sentence, you know, Mary Rafferty's, uh, you know, effectively disciplined performance of patienthood is intertwined with her position uh, as a classed and racialized subject as an Irish immigrant domestic work, which is really interesting to me, of course, because um, not only is, so again, it ties into this, this idea of the, you know, the individual role, but also that not everybody has the same power, right? Uh, and there, and this, this, this continues today, but it's highlighted in some of these, these, these cases, uh, which are, are difficult to read, um, uh, definitely. But it also sort of ties in a little bit, it made me think, the, the two papers actually, made me start to think about, uh, of course this is my own lens, but maybe sort of think about the history of using electrical stimulation uh, in general and how it's carried on to today. It's, it's very common to use, for instance, deep brain stimulation as a, as a, you know, as a cure, quote unquote, or as a, as a treatment. Uh, and it's becoming an ethical debate of whether we should just be using this earlier on, not just for extreme cases. And people are lining up to have deep brain stimulation is this idea that you take an electrode, a piece of metal, and you, you brain surgery, you put this piece of metal in your brain for the rest of your life, and they'll, someone will turn it on. Now it can be really effective, but people are now lining up to say, I would like to improve my memory that way. Um, I, I know that we have a history of, of Alzheimer's in my family. I would like to prevent that. Of course, the surgeries aren't being done for these people, but the questions are there. And so, again, this idea of the power of the individual, also on the other side of people saying, you're not just being... I mean, are these people also being taken advantage of in some way? I think that's, that's a really interesting question. Even though they're volunteering, right? Um, as, you know, Ms. Rafferty may have been as well, might have volunteered at some point, volunteered, right? So the idea of patient consent also comes into this. Well, what is patient consent? Uh, so I thought that was really interesting. I think that, that ties in uh, nicely. Um, Again, issues of subjectivity in medicine, so uh, particularly this idea of the sort of mind-brain branches. Another thing that sort of came to mind as I thought about uh, bloodletting and uh, um, right, sort of dealing with uh, the Rafferty case and sort of these, these issues. Another issue is today, uh, pain. So pain is this concept that is, you know, you, people often go to the doctor for pain, but physicians are not trained really well in pain management. They get very, People would be surprised and often are surprised they have no training in it. And part of the reason is because there's no tool to identify how much pain you're in. It's subjective. So the only way for me to know how much pain you're in is to ask you how much pain you're in and maybe look at some behavioral markers, but those are all easy to fake. And so, not that people fake them all that frequently, I don't think, but this is the issue is that it's really, we rely on this sort of subjective, uh, uh, you know, these subjective reports, which we distrust, I think generally. So it's where, where these sort of issues actually meet in the clinic today, uh, which I think are, are really important. And, and I don't think physicians are dealing with them all that much, somewhat. Maybe you can speak to that. But um, in a place like this, this is where we're dealing with it, right? These ideas of what do we do with these things. Um, OK. So don't take up too much time more time. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, from Matthew's side, I love this idea about, as I said, that art is sort of sketching out consciousness. I think it continues to do this uh, really beautifully. And it reminded me of an instance when I, years ago, was at an interdisciplinary conference and sitting around the table from someone, you know, a physicist and a puppeteer. And uh, we just, and we just sort of, at first you're sort of like, what are we gonna talk about? But of course it takes 10 seconds. You're like, wow, these amazing connections. And the puppeteer told me, because I, I deal a lot in, uh, I deal a lot with emotion and sense of self and disruptions in, in patients with psychiatric disorders that sort of traverse all disorders, um, the, the puppeteer said, why don't you use puppeteers in your study? And I sort of looked at her, not like she was crazy, but like, what do you mean? What are you telling me? She's like, I have mastered the art of putting a sock on my hand and within 10 seconds making you feel for that sock. What, can you, what stimulus can you use that can do that? And I went, yeah, you're right. You're right, right? You have an expertise that's just been completely ignored. Um, well, this is just a you know, tiny vignette of what, what you know, the possibilities there are. But I think that uh, you know, she, she was right. And we continue to sort of ignore them, although social neuroscience 
uh, is starting to address some of these issues, but from a very simplistic uh, sort of viewpoint. Okay. I also love this idea of sort of uh, sort of historicism, which is really fantastic. Uh, I think it's uh, underestimated or maybe ignored in our area entirely. Um, but I, but I love this idea, and I, I've seen sort of like the idea of the sort of competing discourse of threads spun after the death of Washington. I love using this, reading this narrative, where I'm starting, you know, with Washington, going, like, where, where are we going here with this, and bloodletting. Um, and then this idea that it's this period of time, I would never have thought of this, right? So I think this is fantastic that, that you know, this is, this is where we... Um, that bloodletting, which has been happening for centuries, right, may have been transformed. The idea of that might have been transformed. That it was part of regular medicine, whatever that means, right? I think we still struggle with that theme today of regular versus alternative medicines, which also traverse, you know, you know the theme that, that traverses the two, the two papers. So, um, I have so many questions, but I want to get to you. So I'll, I'll just a couple other things. I'll just say. Uh, so the final section of Matthew's paper also reminded me of, of, and there are probably a million other works I've not read about this, it's just it's very popular and recent for me, it's uh, uh, the Ta-Nehisi Coates book, Between the World and Me, I was reminded of this, and how powerful the idea of talking about um, the role of the body in, and just sort of pointing out again, you know, my body and, you know, uh, you know, what is it like to lose my body or have my body controlled? For you people, that might be, this, this idea is probably very common, I don't know, for many of you. Uh, but for neuroscientists, it's just just beginning to be struggled with in terms of the homunculus and in terms of Antonio Damasio's work looking at uh, how the body is mapped into the brain. That the brain is probably not really the controller like we think it is. It's probably not separable at all from the body. Just because you can hold it like this doesn't mean it could exist on its own, and that's a struggle. Again, it's this idea of these, these boundaries that are really artificial. Um, okay, I'll stop there, but I could keep going. But, but I'll stop there. But I, I, there's just so many really interesting ideas that I think uh, traverse both of these papers. And I'd love to hear your comments. Great. Thank yeah. you, David. So let's um, open it up. We, you know, we're a little over time, but I think we can take 10 minutes uh, and just try to kind of begin to bring these topics together, bridge them, think about how to kind of make sense of this stuff together. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. I, I have to, I'm just sorry, I wonder, maybe we could take a few questions all together. Oh, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have two quick questions for Matt. Um, your paper follows after we had um, Alan and Tristan answer Ultra speak previously in the series, so it was a delight to have the continuation of this. So, um, one question I have for you is uh, an invitation to reflect on um, how the literary examples you draw and relate to advances in neuroscience in the 19th century. Are they a reflection of tropes that are happening in science? Do the literary texts themselves make an intervention in scientific ideas, or does um, 19th century neuroscience, if you were to call it that, does it offer a model of analysis for a literary text as it might offer a model of analysis for the brain and the mind? Um, and the second question has to do with class, because um, your central example is George Washington, um, but also I, I was very intrigued by the Thompson realism, um, a, which, as you said, was invented by a farmer. And I wonder if the two um, ontologies that you're discussing are um, have a particular class inflection, and if so, um, does the central example that you've chosen to look at um, speak to that moment of transition as well? Great. So let's just take a few more minutes to get up here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for uh, for Zoe actually. Uh, so the first one, uh, well, I'm really interested in uh, the in your sources, and what I, um, I would like to learn more about the the frequency of circulation of images of Romanus. And uh, I was also wondering if uh, have you ever encountered images of pathological homunculus? Um, very quickly, two great papers. Zoe, this is almost more of a comment, but I was so struck at the end of your talk, the way that you're thinking about the foundational contribution of the non-normative body to 
the um, creation of the normative bodies it was so resonant to me with Jonathan Stern and Mara Mill's recent work on dysmedia. And so if there's anything that is useful to you there, I'd love to hear about it, but otherwise it's just a note. And then for Matt, I was thinking about knowing that your background is sort of in performance studies, among other things, the way that the field that you're describing is effectively a, a performance field where the, both in the realm of the family, you're, it's performative medicine, but then also in the realm of like public discourse, we don't have HIPAA at this point, and so there's this kind of um, realm of healing that is publicly discussed, and maybe you could say more about that. Is it appropriate to think about this as performative or staged or whatever else? And blah blah blah. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks so much for two great papers. On that, I wanted to ask you just about ways of reading the body. Because bloodletting for the first kind of 1,500 years is a primary means of reading what is going on in a space you can't see. But in this form of it, it becomes very, it's not that meaningful. You're saying it's, it's, this, it's a focus on quantity. Then you're not thinking about the foaminess of the blood, the layers that are produced, the sediment. I mean, all of these things that were so important in developing bloodletting. So kind of, I was wondering about that aspect of it, but also with the Thomsonians, how do you then read the stomach and make an assessment about, I mean, are fluids important there, or what are the signs that come into more prominence with that focus? Thank you. Yes. First, thank you very much for this very useful. Um, uh, as a, I, I was a neuroscience student in my, in my 20s, and I remember when we were taught about homunculus, what the struck us um, as 20 years old was a small size of a jelly uh, <laughs> uh, Because it, eventually it does not matter much, and, so I this, decided that it's also a numbing of entire parts of your body that you realize are very low resolution sensitivity. Uh, but also what I was interested in, and I'm really curious where you were going after it, um, I was curious about the vilification of the body, uh, referring to Gregoire Charnayou's vile bodies. I don't know if you're familiar with this one, but very interesting work on how medical experiment, experimentation leads to Vilify to make some bodies vile to be to make them available for experimentation. So I'm, I'm wondering about this dynamic of also justification of experimentation by vilifying uh, uh, bodies who's been experimented as a justification. Uh, and one last point about and maybe a more general question about the making of this neuroscientific subject uh, for reference to animals and the animals. Animals are as viable this thing, and the, the, the becoming animals or becoming rats or the yeah. Take all these. Get, if I just want to throw in one other thing too, um, I Roger Grant's point uh, was speaking very strongly to me in relationship to Zoe, your paper about the, the kind of idea of, and you said it too. There's a normative and then there's a norming, and we sort of average this aggregate data to create the normative, but it's coming from all of these really interesting disparate spaces. And who are those patients? Are they? You know, are they in any way normed to begin with, or are they non? -normed? Um, and in particular, in the homunculus, this idea of the sort of gendered homunculus, I, I don't know if you've thought about looking even backwards further to like, you know, Paracelsus and that kind of sperm, right? Because I think that's the first usage of the term homunculus as a fully firm, fully like a, a man inside the sperm that gets then put inside the body. And then for both of you, I don't know if you both are familiar with Elizabeth Wilson's work, uh, like gut feminism which since we were talking about the stomach as the king, there's something really, it keeps coming up for some reason, but I think it also speaks to what David said, that the, you know, the, the brain is embodied, I mean, I like the embrained also, I can think about that, but, um, or disembrained, yeah. but even more that neural processes or cognition is happening in, this, in other parts that are decentralized, um, and also what does it do in, in Wilson's work, it's about kind of reclaiming a, a, a biologism that feminists can also accept, as opposed to being purely anti-biological. So I was wondering if either of you could talk about those things. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'll just I'll say just a couple of quick things. Um, so yes, I'm, Elizabeth Wilson is in my head all the time, um, and particularly the feminism, the the article rather than the book part, uh -huh. but. Um, uh, and I, in some ways, see what I'm trying to do as a similar kind of project, which is to say, 
what are other modes of um, what are other modes of taking the body seriously that allow different kinds of feminist critiques of the history of science, right? And so that's you know part of how I see this um, happening. And I think um, you know the uh, let's see the question about um, you know, this question about which bodies are made available and how they're made available is, I think, one of the ways that we can think about this and kind of dig into the history of who these patients were. Um, and, uh, you know, the question around kind of consent. So Bartholo was uh, criticized and sanctioned at the time by, um, uh, by professional organizations for what he did, and he said, now that we know what happens to someone when you do this to them, if anybody else does it, they should be accused of murder and convicted for murder, but not me, because I didn't know. And both Bartholo and Penfield, in talking about the histories that led them to the procedures that they did, turned to animals, because before this point, before Mary Rafferty, these experiments had been done primarily in dogs, but also in other animals. And so there's a way that there is a total continuity of these human subjects with these animal subjects, right? And of course, you know, Mel Chen's um, book, uh, Animacies, is one, is I would say the best book for helping us think about the way that the derogation of animality gets turned into the derogation of humanity through practices of racialization and stigmatization related to disability. And, you know, that actually brought me something to something that that is relevant to Matt's paper, if I can kind of pile on more, um, uh, that is about this kind of post-humanism thing, because I, um, I like to stage, uh, when I'm teaching sometimes, a little conversation between Mel Chen and Jane Bennett, um, because in that Vital Matter book, Jane Bennett you know, says, okay, here's all of the ways that by, we can see this kind of vitality and all of these things that are not human, and the most difficult chapter, she says, is going to be this chapter that's about inorganic material, about metal, right? But when you look at, and even the concept of vitalism, right, it has animacy in it. So there is this kind of Mel Chen critique of that thing, which I think is so, so I think this idea of kind of getting, um, sort of getting past post-humanism, right? Or, you know, and one of the ways that I am interested in thinking about it is also kind of what happens if you let go of the category of the human altogether, which of course is also a conversation that's happening in critical black studies and Spiller's work and the question of whether we need to recuperate a version of the human or whether we want to let go of the category of the human altogether. So, you know, that's, those are, I think, are all some of the kind of, you know, the terrain that we, um, that we can kind of get into by thinking about this stuff. And I want to, uh, you know, just briefly, because it's an easy question to answer about the sources. And um, so a lot of this stuff is coming from, it's really idiosyncratic at this point, but a lot of it is coming from looking at textbooks, looking at various kinds of medical textbooks and anatomy textbooks. And there's also this whole range now of blogs where medical students are writing about their experience going through medical school, and a lot of them write about these experiences of the first time that they encounter the homunculus. Um, and uh, sometimes they, you know, they, there's one Australian one that I can remember where a student, the female student came to her female professor after class and said, do I really have a little penis in my brain? And, you know, the, the professor sort of starts reflecting on the gendering of the anatomical, sub, you know, all of these anatomical representations. But to me, that's also a really interesting way that even though the image gets dismissed, and when I talk to, um, you know, when I talk to some clinical researchers who I work with a little bit, and engineers and people who I work with a little bit for a project that I have about um, wearable robotics, um, they often are kind of like, yeah, it's sort of the homunculus, but not really. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting is the way that, that, the, that the idea of localization is actually under revision because of the, the focus on plasticity. Um, and so this image is one that's supposed to be showing um, the way that the homunculus can kind of remap. And a lot of this work is happening around questions related to phantom limb. So interestingly, there's this idea that the homunculus now we think of as being very flexible and plastic and, and is the kind of the, the holy grail of uh, neuroplasticity, actually. Um, 
but these images, the, the idea of that plasticity becomes emblematic of what the brain is and can and should be, and so it's not seen as pathologized even when the human form that is part of that or even when the embodied experience that uh, renders this kind of pain might be read as pathological. So. How much time do we have? <laughs> um, take a couple minutes. A couple minutes. <laughs> That's all I need. Um, so thanks for this bevy of questions. Um, and in terms of, Zoe, your question about Jane Bennett and Sharon Cameron and Carrie Wolf, I mean, one of the things that I do more sort of extensively in the manuscript is sort of use my own training as a sort of, in a sort of historicist um, to sort of complicate that idea of a kind of purely philosophical idea and sort of say, well, of course, how do we think about these kind of ontological blurrings that happen, but if we sort of situate it within historical kind, it's one of the things I was trying to get at, sort of how do differently sort of able bodies and race bodies and sort of class identified bodies, how do those sort of complicate that? And I think there is a, a kind of a kind of wonderful way that there's a kind of um, underground politics going on with this that I don't have time to talk about all here, but you're absolutely right to sort of maybe put them more in the crosshairs. Um, and I think Melchon's a great great way to kind of, I, I do like that as well, sort of staging, staging debates. Um, and that's a great way to think about it. Um, to the many great questions here, I don't think I have time to do all of them justice, um, but maybe we can continue after. Um, but I'll just say this, and it may sort of touch on our new point and some other questions about um, one of the things that I always think about when I think about 19th century medicine is that sort of great image um, of the gross clinic, right? Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is it takes place in an operating theater um, to your point about sort of like these sort of staged staged bodies. And then sort of the triangulation that I often have is between that and sort of P.T. Barnum, sort of American Museum, which is also staging bodies, also staging sort of the able bodies, um, but also the way that the sort of the stage, and this is just to make a kind of pitch for the performative, but to sort of suggest that it both kind of contains, and I think in the Gross Clinic it really is a kind of representation of containment, but it also kind of exceeds that containment, right? And sort of this is the thing that I find really um, kind of fascinating about it, both Barnum's ways that things run outside of what he can do, but we try and get like that also with like audience and performer and sort of artist, um, suddenly these, these different ways of seeing, because it's ultimately theater at its core root really is about ways of, you know, a place to see, it allows for different kinds of vision and different access points to vision. So I think maybe that's one way to think about um, the way that the sort of, to our near point, the literary or the sort of performative or theatrical or whatever, what is its relationship to it? It both is a sort of, um, can obviously sort of reify particular kinds of visions, ways of seeing, but it can also, I think, exceed that. Um, and in really kind of fantastic ways um, that sort of, Go beyond what happens on the, you know, what happens on the page or what happens on the stage, um, and there are different ways. And I think, um, again, too many to go into here, but different ways that we can kind of talk about excessive bodies, or um, just think about some of the things we talked that I heard about yesterday, sort of moderation, immoderate bodies, right? Bodies that are sort of um, grotesque, grotesque for their appetites, right? That sort of go beyond. That's maybe one way of kind of maybe poorly linking all of some answers to all of these questions, but that's about where I am. That's perfect. Thank you very much to all our speakers. <laughs> um, okay, so what time is the next session? Just so there's a break or? We have a break. Okay. Yeah, it sounds great. Coffee break in 15 and 10 minutes back here. Keep being soft about the headphones.